Hello, and in this talk, we're going to look at a few examples of this concept of complex impedance. Reminder, complex impedance is the ratio of the voltage across a component to the current flowing through a component, if you can assume that both the voltage and the current are cissoids. As I mentioned before, if you do make this assumption, that all of your voltages and currents everywhere in the circuit can be represented as cissoids, then you can produce equivalence to Ohm's law for resistors and capacitors. Specifically, for a capacitor, we can say that the voltage across a capacitor is equal to the current through a capacitor, times the complex impedance of a capacitor, which is 1 over j omega c, as it turns out. And for an inductor, the voltage across an inductor is the current through an inductor times j omega l, where j omega l is the complex impedance of the inductor. And these are analogous to Ohm's law, which says that for resistors, the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. Now all of these are, provided the frequency doesn't change, constant in the circuit. And that means that all of the results that we've derived for Ohm's law previously can also be applied to capacitors and inductors, provided you treat capacitors as having a complex impedance of 1 over j omega c, and inductors as having a complex impedance of j omega l, including the formulas for putting components in series and parallel. For resistors, we know that if you put two resistors in series, the total resistance is just the sum of the two resistors. And we can generalize this to the impedance of two components in series is the sum of the two impedances. That means that for an inductor, if we put two inductors in series, then the total impedance would be j omega l1 plus j omega l2, which is j omega l1 plus l2. And we could represent the total impedance as an inductance of value j omega l total and derive that the total inductance must be the sum of the two individual inductances. Similarly, if we put two capacitors in series, then 1 over j omega c, which is the complex impedance of the first capacitor, plus 1 over j omega c2, which is the complex impedance of the second capacitor, must be equal to the total complex impedance of the combination of these two capacitors. Well, this is 1 over j omega times 1 over c1 plus 1 over c2. And we can identify that as being the complex impedance of a capacitor with value c total, where 1 over c total is 1 over c1 plus 1 over c2. So if you combine two capacitors in series, then you have to use this formula to work out the total effective capacitance. You'll notice it looks very like the formula for two resistors in parallel. We can do an exactly similar thing with components in parallel, and we'd end up with, for two resistors in parallel, the total resistance would be R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. We've derived that one before. For two inductors in parallel, they behave similarly. But for two capacitors in parallel, then 1 over z total is 1 over z1 plus 1 over z2. Well, 1 over the impedance of a capacitor is just j omega c1. So 1 over z total would be 1 over 1 over j omega c total, or just j omega c total. And that is equal to 1 over z1, which is j omega c1, 
plus 1 over z2, which is j omega c2. All the j omegas would cancel. We'd end up with c total equals c1 plus c2. So put two capacitors in parallel and the capacitances add up. Put two capacitors in series and we have to use this formula, which is a very similar formula to the one we got with two resistors in parallel. This is just a summary of these results. Resistors and inductors work pretty much the same. Capacitors work, if you like, the other way around. The formula for capacitors in series is similar to the formula for resistors in parallel. The formula for capacitors in parallel is similar to the formula for resistors in series. Now for resistors, the complex impedance is perfectly real. For capacitors and inductors, as we've seen, the complex impedance is perfectly imaginary. However, if you start combining these two components, you can end up with networks which have a complex impedance which is neither perfectly real nor perfectly imaginary, but complex. This one, for example, we have two components in series, a resistor and a capacitor. And we can use all of the results that we've got before for combining the impedances of two components in series. A resistor has a complex impedance of R. A capacitor has a complex impedance of 1 over J omega C. So the total complex impedance across this network would be R plus 1 over J omega C. And that's complex. It has both a real and an imaginary component. This is maybe a slightly more interesting or surprising one. Here we have an inductor and a capacitor in series. So the total impedance is going to be the sum of the impedances of the two components because they're in series. The inductor is J omega L. The capacitor is 1 over J omega C. So the total impedance of these two in series is just J omega L plus 1 over j omega c. But we're asked specifically what the impedance is when omega squared equals 1 over lc. So let's think about this for a moment. Omega squared equals 1 over lc, which means that if I bring the l up here and one of these omegas down here, omega l is going to be equal to 1 over omega c. If I substitute in for omega L, I would get J over omega C plus one over J omega C. Now, multiplying top and bottom of this term by J, that would give me a J on the top and a J squared on the bottom. J squared is just equal to minus one. So that would give me J omega C plus minus J omega C. In other words, j omega c 1 minus 1 or nothing, 0. This network has no impedance at all at that one particular frequency. And that means that no matter how much current is flowing through this network, if you're at that specific frequency, there will be no voltage across this network at all. There will be a voltage across the inductor and a voltage across the capacitor, but they will be in antiphase. So that if you add them up and look at the voltage across the whole network, the answer would be zero. It's just this happening again. We might have a voltage like this across the capacitor and a voltage like this across the inductor, but the total voltage across both of those components by Kirchhoff's voltage law, you would just add up the individual voltages and you would get nothing. You can plot these complex impedances on an Argand diagram. Resistors 
have a perfectly real impedance, so they would appear somewhere here on the positive real axis. Inductors have a positive imaginary impedance, so they would appear somewhere on this axis. And capacitors have a negative imaginary impedance, because you can always write 1 over j omega c as minus j over omega c. So the complex impedance of a capacitor is always negative imaginary. Something like this, which has a complex impedance around here, is a combination of a resistor with a real impedance and a capacitor with a negative imaginary impedance. So for example, that dot there could represent a component which is maybe something like this. A resistor in series with a capacitor. The final thing to be aware of is how these impedances change with frequency. For an inductor, it's j omega l, which means as the frequency goes up, so does the complex impedance. And if you plotted the complex impedance against frequency, you'd get a slope like this for an inductor. For a resistor, the complex impedance is just equal to r, the resistance. It's constant with frequency. For a capacitor, the complex impedance is 1 over j omega c. So as the frequency goes up, the complex impedance goes down. And if you plotted the impedance of a capacitor against frequency, you'd get something like this curve. That's all for this time. Next time, we'll have a look in a bit more detail about how to use superposition to represent real sinusoidal signals in terms of cissoids.